Chapter Twenty of Kitty Alone by Sabine Baring Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Twenty: A Face in the Water. Kate Quarm was very happy on the moor. Her father had fetched her from Ashburton and had lodged her in a cottage near Dartmeet, the point where the east and west darts, rushing, foaming from the moors. Dancing over boulders, breaking over granite floors, plunging under tufts of golden gorse, and through breaks of osmond and male fern, reach each other and meet in one silver flood. The weather was fine, though cold, that is to say, the sun was hot, but a keen east wind blew. But then this is one of the charms of the moor, that shelter can always be found from the wind. A mighty bank of mountains rose as a wall against the east, and in its dingles and dells, dense with gorse, now in blaze of flower, the air was warm and balmy and still. At Coombe Cellars, Kate had been kept continually employed. Her aunt, an active woman, gave the child no rest. If she saw her flag in her work, Zara goaded her with reproach to fresh activity. She was, moreover, never accorded a word of encouragement. Zara accepted her work as a matter of course. If it was well done, that was but as it ought to be. Everything that fell short of well was occasion for scolding. Kate's nature was one that needed repose from manual and sordid labor, for her mind desired to be active, and craved for freedom in which to expand, and for liberty to seek material on which to feed. This Zara did not understand. With any other activity except that of the body in scrubbing and rubbing, in cooking and baking, she had no sympathy. She entertained a positive aversion for books. She had no eye for beauty, no ear for melody, no heart for poetry. Now Kate had leisure. Now, for the first time in her life. In which her soul could draw its tender wings out of its case and flutter them in freedom, she felt much as must the mayfly when it breaks from its chrysalis. It was, moreover, a joy to think that her father had considered her so far as to require her to be sent to the moor to recover. He usually paid little heed to Kitty, and now her heart was warm with gratitude because he had given her. That very thing of all others which she most desired, rest in the presence of nature awakening under a spring sun. Kate had another source of pleasure with her, as Walter Bramber parted from her at Ashburton. He put a little book into her hand and said, "I will lend it to you. I know you will value it." The book was Wordsworth's Poems. As she sat beside her father in the gig, she had her hand on the volume all the while. And her heart swelled with excitement and eagerness to read it. At night she hugged the book to her bosom and fell asleep with both hands clasped over it. She could hardly endure that night should, with its darkness, deny her the happiness of reading. She woke early and, in the breaking daylight, devoured the pages. As she read, she laughed and cried, laughed and cried with sheer delight. She had a book to read. And such a book. This happy girl turned first to the verses on the daffodils that she had learned by heart, to make quite certain that she had all, that not a line had been missed nor a word got awry. Then she looked at the little poems on the calendine, and never did a famished child devour a meal with greater avidity than Kate read and master these verses. There was much in Wordsworth that she could not understand. But the fact that she encountered passages that were unintelligible to her were of advantage. Her clear intellect, striking on these hard portions, threw out sparks, ideas that had light in them. The book not only nourished her mind but proved educative to her imagination. Kate was at first overwhelmed with the flood of happiness that rolled over her. Her eyes could not satiate themselves with the beauty of the moorland scenery. She ran among the rocks. She dived into the combes, she stepped on the boulders over the water, she watched the workmen engaged in felling trees. 
Spring flowers peeped from behind rocks. Bog plants peered out of the morasses. Kate began collecting. She dried flowers between the leaves of her prayer book. She scrambled among the towering rocks that overhung the dart below the meeting of the waters, and watched the shadows and lights travel over the vast tract of moorland that stretched away as far as the eye could see in every direction but the east, where the river rolled out of its mountain cradle into a lap of the richest woodland. Sometimes the beauty of the scenery, the variety of the landscape, were too much for her. She sought change and repose by creeping among the rocks and drawing the book from her bosom. Yet she could not read for long. The verses exacted close attention, and a flash of passing sun, or impatience at some passage she could not comprehend, made her close the volume and recommence her rambles. The exhilarating air, the brilliancy of the light, the complete change from the mild and languid atmosphere of the Tyne estuary told on Kate's spirits and looks. Her cheeks gathered roundness and color, and her tread acquired elasticity. Her spirits were light. They found vent occasionally in racing the cloud shadows over a smooth hillside. One day, with her lap full of moss of every rainbow hue, she came upon the rector of Coombe and Tynehead, painting. At her exclamation, he turned, recognized her, and smiled. So, I thought I must soon see you, he said. My dear little kitty, I come with messages for you and kind inquiries. From whom? From uncle and aunt? No, not from them. The schoolmaster, Mr. Bramber, when he heard whither I was coming, begged me to see you and ascertain how you were, and whether you liked the book he lent you. Oh, sir, I read it every day. I know several pieces by heart. That you are well, I see. I never saw you with such a glow of health and happiness in your bonny face before. Thank you, sir. And will you see him soon? Whom? Bramber? Yes, sir, answered Kate, the glow in her face deepening. And will you say that I have been picking the flowers as they come out, and I can find them, and I want to know what they are called? God brought the beast to Adam to name them, and I do not think Adam can have been happy with the beast till he had given each a name. It is so with me and the flowers. I see them, and I love them, but I don't feel content till I can tell what each is called. Mr. Bramber can name them all. You have made a collection? Yes. I have dried them in my prayer book. They are waiting for Mr. Bramber to name, but— Kate drew back. I am in your way, sir. You are painting the old bridge. Yes, but you can sit down there if you like, and will not disturb me. May I? Oh, I shall be pleased. Kate placed herself on a lichen-covered rock on one side, at a little distance from the water. I have left my few sheep for a couple of days, said Mr. Fielding, apologetically, partly to Kate, mostly to himself. But I do not think I have done wrong. Moses went up into the mount, and came back to his people with his face shining. I do not know but it seems to me that when I have been here aloft, speaking with nature and nature's God, face to face, that I can go back and carry with me some of the brightness and the freshness and the fragrance of the mountain. I may be wrong, finding an excuse for myself, because I love to come here. Please, sir, said Kate, the great master of all dismissed the multitude and went up into the mountain apart. Yes, child, yes, answered the rector, painting as he talked. And when he came down, he walked on the stormy waves. And I, his humble follower, I think I can tread on the troubles and cares of life erect and not be swallowed up after I've been here. I do not know how I shall bear to go back to Coombe Cellars, said Kate sadly. You will go back braced to do your work. We cannot always play, Kitty dear. You know the fable of the bow. It was relaxed only that it might be the better weapon when restrung. Besides, when you return you will have pleasure. I shall think about my delightful holiday. Yes, 
and learn the names of the flowers you have dried in your prayer book, said Mr. Fielding, with a twinkle in the corner of his eye. Kate dropped her head in confusion, but looked up again and said, frankly, Yes, that will be pleasant, and I can tell where each grew and how I found it. Tell whom? Your aunt? A faint crease in the old man's cheeks showed he was smiling. No, sir, she won't care. I shall tell Mr. Bramber, if I have the chance. Kitty, I get very downhearted over my work sometimes. Then I come up here and gather courage and strength and— and trust, Kitty. You will return to Coombe Cellars, strengthened and nerved to do your duty well and hopefully. Remember, it was kind of your aunt to let you come. She has to drudge hard whilst you are absent, but she does it because you have been ill and need relaxation in mind and invigoration of body. She does it, Kitty, because she loves you. Oh, sir— Kate colored with astonishment and with a twinge of pain at her heart. Yes, dear little friend, she loves you. She is not a demonstrative person. She is a clear-headed, practical woman. She has had a hard life and much to try her, and to give her a cold and perhaps repellent manner. Nevertheless, her heart is sound and warm. When you were ill, I spoke with her. I saw how anxious she was for your welfare. I saw into her heart, and I read love there. Kate trembled, and let the mosses fall from her lap and strew themselves about her feet. The tears came into her eyes. Oh, sir, I should like to go home at once and do everything I can for her. I did not think she really cared for me. You do not return till your father decides that you are to go back to work. Then you will return with a good courage, as I said. With all my heart, answered Kate fervently, and her face brightened as though the sun shone on it. Afraid of disturbing the old rector at his painting, Kate withdrew. She was happy at heart. What he had said had done her good. She had shrunk from the thought of return to the humdrum of her usual life, but Mr. Fielding had given her a motive for facing work with cheerfulness. It was a delight to her to think that her aunt loved her. She loved her aunt. Daily association with Sarah had made her cling to the hard, capacious woman. She had had no one else to love, and the young heart must love someone. Kate delighted to lie by the river, or lie on a rock in it, and look down into its pellucid pools, or at the flowing crystal where it broke between the stones. She was accustomed to the muddy estuary, and though the sea-water when it flowed was clear, it had none of the perfect transparency of this spring-water near its source. The sea sweeping up the creek was as bottle-green glass, but this was liquid crystal itself, without color of any sort, and through it everything in the depths was visible as though no medium intervened. Kate could look at the shining pebbles, at the waving water-weed, at the darting fish. When she had left Mr. Fielding, she went to one of her favorite haunts beside the dart, where it brawled over the cataract of rocks, and then spread into a pool still as glass. Now she saw what puzzled her, and set her active brain questioning the reason. As she looked into the water, she could see no reflection of her own face. The light sky was mirrored, and where the shadow of her head came, she could see far more distinctly to the bottom of the pool than elsewhere. Indeed, when a fish darted past, she could discern its fins and scales, but when it passed beyond her shadow, its form became indistinct. Then Kate rose on her elbows, and as she did this, the sun caught her cheek and nose, and cheek and nose were at once reflected in the water, and where the reflection came, there the water was less transparent to her eyes. To observe was to rouse in the girl's mind a desire to find an explanation for the very simple phenomenon that puzzled her. She was thus engaged, raising her face, then a hand, so as to be now sunlit, then to intercept the light and see what the effect was on the water, 
when she was startled to observe in the liquid mirror the reflection of a second face looking down from above. The sun was on it, in the eyes, and they glittered up at her from below. With an exclamation of alarm, she turned and saw a man standing above her. End of chapter 20